chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Kim for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for gathering here and, and talking about this. I wanted to just start by responding to a comment made earlier in this hearing. Uh, another member of this committee pressing his point about schools cited the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics about next steps with our kids. I was interested in learning more about this, so I just quickly researched this, and I found an important clarifying comment made by the Academy uh, regarding this statement being misunderstood and misrepresented. I wanted to read part of it. Candace Jones from the AAP said, the original guidance was always written as being a strong advocates for the goal of kids physically being present in schools with a lot of other, a lot of things to consider. And that's where things got misrepresented and misunderstood. In fact, she goes on to say, we have, we have to consider COVID activities in the community. It should not be politically motivated, and we have to think about what's best for our kids, teachers, and families. In fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics joined with the American Federation of Teachers, National Education Association, and others to issue a joint statement saying, science should drive decision-making on safely reopening schools. Public health agencies must make recommendations based on evidence, not politics. We should leave it to health experts who tell us when the time is best to open up school buildings and listen to educators and administrators to shape how we do this. For instance, schools in areas of high levels of COVID community spread should not be compelled to reopen against the judgment of local experts. A one size fits all approach is not appropriate for return to school decisions. Withholding funding from schools that do not open in person full time would be a misguided approach. These are incredibly important uh, things to consider here. I'm a father of a young boy that's supposed to start school soon. I would love to have him get a great education and be able to enjoy his year in kindergarten. I want everything for him. And I don't want anyone to accuse me or anyone else of not wanting my kid or our kids to have the education that they deserve. But my education, my public school education that I got in my district also taught me to respect science and expertise and to make sure families and education professionals are part of that discussion. Going back to the topic of our hearing here, I wanted to just go to Chair Bernanke. Uh, I thank you for what you've been saying, the work that you've been doing with regards to state and local governments and need to be able to fund that. I was actually just at a small business committee hearing this morning where Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, I asked him about this issue, and he wouldn't commit to me that he would support this type of aid in the next funding package because we should not quote unquote bail out states with mismanaged budgets is, is how uh, we talked about it there. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask uh, you know, your, your situation on this. Does your experience on a state reopening commission give you any concern that additional funding for state governments in the midst of this pandemic will create incentives for mismanagement? No, I think the uh, the money can be structured in ways that eliminates that incentive. It can be done in terms of block grants, you know, for education, for example, or for health care. It can be done by formulas that don't relate to the uh, existing tax burden, things like population, unemployment rate, et cetera. So I think there's ways to provide the money in, that will not be provided incentive for, for mismanagement. You can make sure you can re require that the money not be used to increase pension funds or cut taxes, for example. So uh, I, I don't think that's really uh, an issue. And the more important issue is that the states and localities are both big employers and also the front line in terms of critical services uh, yeah. to the public. No, I appreciate that. And look, in addition to the issue about mismanagement that you addressed, I also want to address the use of the term bailout here, because it keeps coming up again, came up in this hearing as well. In my state of New Jersey, we only get back around 75 cents to 81 cents for every dollar we put into the federal government. Other states get back a dollar, over a dollar, sometimes over two dollars for every dollar that they put in. So I just don't appreciate this notion that federal taxpayers are bailing out states like mine. Uh, for years, residents of my state have been helping other states doing more than our fair share. Now we need help and we're just asking for what is fair here in the middle of a pandemic. But even beyond that point, Chair Bernanke, uh, you talk about sort of the strong sense of the challenges that we face at the state level could have dire circumstances on the national economy. So it's, it's I want to just hear a little bit more from you about that, about if we don't help states, what is that going to do when it comes to our, our responsibility to our national economy? I think we made this mistake in the recovery from the 2000, 
2007, 2009 recession after the global financial crisis. We had a $800 billion federal program, a fiscal program, but the states uh, were forced to contract, lay off people. And an estimate I saw recently was, as I mentioned before, is that cut about a half a percentage point off the growth rate as the economy was trying to recover from that serious recession. So it will have implications for spending and jobs for the economy as a whole, as well as for people, you know, within within New Jersey. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Back to you.